Hello and welcome to the Cup of Tri Triathlon podcast. We're brought to you every week by our sponsors, oxygenatic.com, wearebikehouse.co.uk and triathlonbox.co.uk. Now then, in a change from the usual format, Helen is away. She's flown off to Rio to cover the Olympics for her employer, for her other employer. And so we've got super standing Joe Skipper on the show filling in. How are you doing, Joe? Yeah, I'm good, mate. Thanks for having me back. Oh, it's great to have you back on the show, mate. It's uh, it's nice to have you, and it's nice to hear you managed to finish stuffing your dinner down yourself just before we can record as well. Yeah, I smashed it, didn't I? <laughs> Get the calories in. That's good to see. How have you been? How are the legs recovering? Oh, really good. Yeah, back into uh, to training now, and um, not doesn't seem like I've lost too much on the bike and run, but my swimming, it always amazes me when I have some time off, how it can go downhill so quickly. <laughs> it's like a... Hello, Rob. There we go. We're back again. Is it, is it carrying on? It is, yeah. It's all cool. It looks like it's still recorded. That's good. We'll just keep on talking, mate. No right. drama. It's the joy of the internet, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so your swimming was falling apart, was it? Yeah, it doesn't feel too good. It feels like I'm swimming for a treacle. <laughs> Who are you swimming with at the moment? Um, there's a, a Facebook group um, up here called Norwich Training Group. So we just post things on there. And um, and then um, like different people each time. There's about six, probably about six, maybe seven of us uh, in the group. And there might be you might swim with one other person. You might swim with like three or four people. <clears throat> right. So guys, just rock up today if if and when they can, kind of thing. Yeah, we just post up like we're going. I don't know, say Monday at three p.m. Um, this is the set. Who wants to come? And yeah, and then people just join, rock, like rock up and join in. All right. Gotcha. How's it been for you, uh, sort of training full time and stuff? Is it is it difficult for you to get into a routine and a, a sort of day by day, week by week basis? No, nah, it's pretty easy. <laughs> I just, uh, <laughs> I yeah, I, I just love doing it, so, uh, so it's pretty easy. And um, I'll have a, like a plan before, like at the start of the week or before the start of the week. Um, so I, like, I know really like two weeks, but before I do sessions, what I've got, so I know what I've got coming up and everything like that. So, yeah. Yeah, good. And what are you aiming for now that Ross over? Is it the big build up to Hawaii? Is that the is that the the only thing on your mind at the moment? Yeah, pretty much. I'm going to do a couple of seventy point threes in the in the build up to it. But the bit that I'll probably like use them as training really with the yeah. uh, the big goal to be to do well at Kona. Yeah, which seventy point threes are you doing, mate? I'm going to do uh, Dublin next next weekend. And then I'm going to do Challenge Walt- Walshy. Um, oh, nice. Remember. The old chocolate box race, eh? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was going to do Grand Canaria, but I've uh, decided that's probably not the best idea looking at how long, like the flights getting out there back. And then I'd only be back for six days and then I'd be flying to Kona. So I thought it's probably a bit too much traveling and not enough training at a crucial point in time. So I'm not going to do that one anymore. I gotcha. And how long do you plan to go out to uh, to Hawaii for, mate? Before you go out there, just just two weeks this time. I I went out last year quite a lot beforehand, and I, yeah. I think it was actually detrimental um, because you you get acclimatized to the heat, but you kind of get your maximum acclimatization. It felt it felt for me personally about two weeks after being out there for two weeks, and uh, because it's so hot and humid, I I found that you couldn't do your hard interval sessions specifically on the run properly so you actually got less fit um after two weeks and not any more benefit from being out there yeah. in, in the heat so yeah it's a little bit like going to altitude i think and that you get you get some acclimation effect but you also get this effect that you can't train as hard as you'd ideally like to so oh that's interesting it'll be it'll be good to see if that works out for you this year man and you can just find those extra few percent well ne- next year what i would do like if i was I'll have, I'm going to plan it around like because I tried out actually training this year, and I think the ideal thing to do for me as well, because of how long it seemed like I, it took for me to get the benefit from altitude, I would probably go out and train at altitude and then come down from altitude probably four weeks before the race, and then go out to Kona two weeks before and then race. And I think for me that'd be optimal. Like if I was mm. really going for it and doing everything, I think if I did that, I'd be in really good good shape and that's what i'll do next year because of all the traveling with races and so forth this year it wouldn't really 
work out like I'd have to be literally going to altitude like next week and I've only just got back from Roth and back into training so it's a bit too much too soon yeah yeah which makes me wonder obviously it's it's difficult sort of finding the money to go off and do all this kind of stuff how has life been for you since uh since Roth because really that's a it's another breakthrough to another level of performance isn't it really going sub eight and breaking the British record and and it being such a massive race have you had uh, a lot more interest from sponsors and things like that since you've come back um not not so much from sponsors I've been on I've been on well I've been on the local news quite a bit but I'd made contacts with them beforehand, like over the course, I suppose, of the last 18 months. So I was on like Look East on like t- the local TV, um, in the papers and everything like that and on Radio Norfolk. Um, but from actual sponsors, not a massive amount, but most of that is all done kind of like October time onwards. So I might be on the radar of a few different companies now and then if I can do a good result in Kona and obviously a bit of networking in October out there then that could lead to to good things but I think a lot of companies have got all their they're all their budgets are all tied up at the moment so they wouldn't I they, see. Could, they couldn't it's all done either it seems January to December or April to March depending on like what companies so nothing could really be done halfway through the season but you just want to kind of get on people's radars and almost like make make contact if, if you can uh, looking ahead to yeah. 2017. So a real good, strong performance from you out in Kona, and I think you've popped up on a lot of people's radars this year, hey? Yeah, exactly. If I could do a good result in Kona, then that would really put me in good stead. Good stuff, man. Well, listen, I could sit and talk to you all day, mate, but we've got races around the world to talk about, haven't we? Yeah, yeah. Where should we go first, man? Shall we go to the 70.3 out in Budapest? Yeah, I think that's a good choice. Yeah, let's start with that one. A bit of bit of British interest there with Emma Pallant finishing in second place in the ladies' race. Vanessa Raw finishing in fourth place as well. And Sarah Lewis as well, who's an age group, are finishing in ninth, which is pretty damn good. Have you ever been out to Budapest, Way? I have, yeah. I went on holiday there um, back in 2014, I think. It's meant to be a good race. I had an athlete race it last year and he raved about it. Said it was a, you know, really well organised. Roads were all closed, super flat, fast, and uh, and the runs around the town centre, isn't it? That you get loads of support there. I'm I'm not sure. I'm, I mean, Rob, when I went out there, it was on holiday, so I was eating and drinking. So, <laughs> so I can tell you, there's some good there's some good bars there and cheap cheap restaurants. <laughs> I don't know what the running's like though, or cycling. We'll have to ask Emma Pallant, hey? Yeah. So she got second behind uh, Lusa Hutthaler, um from Austria. You see, Helen's not here. She can do all the pronunciations, mate. <laughs> How's your Austrian? I can give it a go. Lisa Hutthaler. <laughs> there we go. I, I like it, what, yeah. I don't know if that's right or not. But you know what, though? To be to be fair to Emma, really, you've got to be calling her the winner because Lisa shouldn't even be racing. Um, well, there's a lot of controversy around her coming back to race. She was what was she banned for? Was she done for doing EPO? EPO. Over in the men's race, we had Bertrand Billard from France take it out in 3:41. Horst Reichel in second, and Ivan Tutkin of Russia in third. Do you race any of those guys? Um, not for a long while, but I saw that that Victor Sametsov in fourth. I he was actually in Font Romeo when I was out there. Um. Oh, right, in, okay. In France, uh, uh, earlier in the year, he came out about, I think I had about a week left when he came out and did some training. That seemed, but I, I think I might have raced against that horse, Raikel, before. Um, his name rings a bell, but I'm not sure. Not I, I'll pass him across much with many of them. Yeah, it's uh, it looks like a fast course though. A three forty one's pretty uh, pretty smoking for uh, even for pro athletes these days. Yeah, the bike times are really quick out there. Yeah. There's a great photo on Slow Twitch. It just looks like Zwift, you know? Yeah. Big flat open road, bridges. Yeah, it looks really good, man. Yeah. No, it looks like hey, a, listen, it looks like a... I'm going to take us over to um, to the Alp d'Huez long course. And before we have a little uh, a talk about what goes on here, we've got a voice message from Lucy Gossage. So we'll put a little pause into this now and insert the audio from Lucy Gossage. Just finished racing at Alp d'Huez long course. Hi, it's Lucy here. Um, I just thought I'd uh, let you know about Alderez. Um, Not a race I had planned to do uh, when I crossed the finish line in Bolton. Um, I was going to the Alps on holiday with some friends and um, we booked this back in January and, and at the time I planned to do Alderez, so I had persuaded another friend to come out with me. But obviously after Bolton I thought, uh, no way. Um, 
I actually decided to do it when I uh, bonked at the end of an um, epic six-hour ride uh, the Monday before, which is a, probably a slightly surreal, uh, stupid decision. Um, but, yeah, I love this race. And at the end of the day, I, I was kind of just interested to see how my body would hold up. Um, so I thought I'd give it a go. And... Um, yeah, FOMO perhaps. I didn't want to be standing on the start on the sidelines watching. <laughs> it's not often you get to race in the mountains, um, and it's an it's an iconic race. It was definitely one that everyone should do. Um, it was hard. I, I somehow found myself out of T1 first, um, and uh, yeah, gave it a good go on the bike, but um, my legs kind of died halfway up the first climb. So I had three hours riding on empty, and the run was a suffer fest. Um, but yeah, absolutely brilliant day out, um, stunning views, stunning weather, um, and yeah, no regrets about doing it. Probably a silly decision perhaps, but definitely a fun one. <laughs> Cheers, bye. Cool beans. So Lucy there's taken second place, um, 6.37 behind Jeannie Clone in 6.33. Paris Edwards backing up in 6.53 behind him. So Lucy and Jeannie really went at it, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, I think... Uh... Jean, Jeannie got her, um, a bit of a gap on her, didn't she, on the bike, and then Lucy was chasing her down a bit. Yeah. Um, I'm surprised Lucy's done so well, though, in this race, because she's done so much racing recently. Like, she only recently did um, Ironman UK, didn't she? Like two weeks ago to Ironman UK, wasn't it? Yeah, she says um, in a little voice message there that she's basically, she was whooped, she went out there for a holiday and then made the last-minute decision to do it. Yeah, that's pretty... Uh, pretty mad isn't it like god uh yeah she likes uh putting herself she up just loves it. racing doesn't she yeah, yeah definitely <laughs> She is over on the men's side. Uh, James Kanama takes it out in 558 from Timothy Van Houtem and Sven Van Luck from Belgium in 605. You race James Kanama much? Yeah I've raced against him a few times. Uh, What's he like as a competitor? Um, oh, when I Whenever I've raced against him, there's, there's been quite deep fields. There's been quite a few of us, so it hasn't really been like you've had to kind of push hard the whole way. So it hasn't it hasn't really been like a head to head. Do you know what I mean? Like one of us chasing the other, or like in kind of like close combat, should I say, where you're on the bike together and you think, oh, it's going to come down to a run and race or something like that. So it's hard to really say because I've, I raced against him in Challenge Dubai, and there was obviously like. 20 or 30 guys that were like a really high standard and it was just everyone kind of just smashing it <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, you didn't really think about like what the per what the other person's like or you they were just trying to catch the person in front of them and stop the person behind getting them yeah got you is it um is it i'm going to ask you this like as a, as a pro racing do you sometimes have races where it's like quite cruisy and other times you have races where loads of guys turn up and you end up all smashing each other? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you can get you end up getting in a pack on on the bike um, and it feels like you're going really easy. Uh, and But you're just kind of waiting for the right move because obviously you can sit like even if you say 10, 12 meters behind and there's like say five, six of you in a line at the end of the line, you might be putting out 60 watts less than at the front at least, maybe even more. Um so if you're doing it, say, at the front, you might be pushing 310 watts. A person mm. who's like fifth or sixth in line might be putting out 250, which is a hell of a lot easier. Um, so you could go to the front, put a dig in, and then they'd all try and get right behind you. And it would be that you'd be working really hard, whereas they'd be going really easy. So you kind of have to wait for the right moment. Sometimes you think, God, this is ridiculous. We're going so slow. Like so many they, people are going to catch us. But you, you have to kind of almost like just keep telling yourself just wait until like you know like if you know there's a hill on the course or somewhere where you can make a decisive move um and you can go or if you know you can beat the other guys who you're with on the run then you you're not really bothered you know you'll just go for it like stay in there with them and uh, take your chances on the run that's if, yeah. if you're confident of it if you're not confident you think you're gonna you'd like a bit of a buffer or you know you have to get a bit of a buffer then you'll be waiting for the for the right moment and then like you say there's other races where it's, you're just literally on the limit the whole time and it feels like it's an unsustainable pace, but you just kind of turn yourself, keep going, keep going, like egging yourself on. You either think it's going to, um, the pace is going to ease up or you hope that the others will blow up before you <laughs> kind of, uh, yeah. it can be one extreme or the other. Do you think there's anything they can do to make the racing a bit more, a lot I don't better. want to say a bit more fair, but 20 meter you know, draft rule. Definitely. Do you think that's what they should do? Absolutely. If you get a 20 meter draft rule, the racing would be completely different. 
Um, it, like they did that in Dubai and everyone has to work hard on the bike. There's no easy option. And then everyone gets on the run and you're smashed. And that's why in Challenge Dubai, had there not been um, the, uh, you know, where people took the shortcut, um, had yeah. that incident, um, the racing would have been really close. Everyone was close on the run and you're all starting the run with, na- with legs that are nailed. And that's why there wasn't really that many quick run times, despite having such a world-class field, because everyone gets onto the run and everyone's feeling tired. And the swim doesn't have such an impact because at the moment, it's like if you if you're not in the front pack on out of the swim, you're really putting yourself up against it on the uh, on on the bike because of that draft and benefit you get at ten meters and twelve meters. But half the time, people will be seven eight meters behind each other because they know the officials won't do anything. But if you made it twenty meters, everyone has to work. Hello, are you there? Yeah, yeah back Ch- again. Chances are they're only going to be fifteen meters behind anyway. Um, so it would make it a lot a lot better, definitely. Well, what the reason that they don't do that then, Joe? What's the reason you think that the officials don't just I, go, well, we'll make it 20 metres for the pros? I really don't know. I can understand they can't do it for the age groupers, I but... I really don't know because they've got the space at the front of the race. It's not as if like space is a, a, a problem like what you've got in the age group field where, say, 200 people might get out of the water within like a minute or two of each other in the elite race, and it's, it's not a problem. Um, yeah. So they should do it, but the, the pro triathlon union thing sent something through the other day saying that they've had um like some dis- discussions with Ironman and challenge about rules and they're trying to make it so everyone so all the racers follow the same set of rules um and is there anything else what people think they they should bring up and talk about and I emailed them and said yeah you you need to get a, a 20 meter draft rule because it makes the racing a lot better a lot fairer and at, then you are definitely going to get the best person win um but yeah, we'll see if they respond to it, hey? Well, he responded and said, yeah, that is a talk, that is something what we're planning on talking with, but they need to get the racers on board and then the race rules official, official and like, uh, making sure people uh, stick to it because a lot of the time you'll get a motorbike who's supposed to be policing the drafting and it's like they're almost scared of giving the pros a penalty. Um <laughs> Well, that's an interesting point, isn't it? Because you know, Jimmy riccatello has got a great reputation for doing a really stellar job out in, Kona, out in Kona, but sort of in the smaller races, you wonder whether yeah, out in Kona, whether the fantastic. referees necessarily have that sort of confidence to do the job that they actually need to do. That's the thing. If they were all like him, it wouldn't be a problem. Twelve meters would be absolutely fine because he doesn't care who you are. No one's name's big enough. Um, and whereas in in Europe or uh, other areas, America, from my experience, is pretty good. But Europe, it's a, it's a bit of a travesty, to be honest. Like it's like they don't, they're too scared. People's name, they think some people's names are too big, and they won't give the penalties out. Interesting, man. I have to hope that you get uh, you get the benefit of that out in Kona, then, buddy. Yeah, I think he's pretty good in Kona. They say that the uh, the lines on the road are twelve meters, which I'd be a bit skeptical as to whether they're twelve meters. They're probably more like ten, but I know they're strict though. If you um, if you do like break the rules then that's it you yeah you've got a penalty like they don't care who you are game over yeah game over exactly (laughs) well uh we had mary beth ellis racing over in i'm a maastricht this weekend and uh, she's been really ill hasn't she she's had lyme disease for ages so to see her come back with a win man is brilliant yeah and she absolutely dominated it didn't she as well yeah, 30 minutes or 25 minutes ahead of the next lady. Yeah, that's uh, pretty impressive. She was up Good there stuff in the men's there. as well. Looking at it, she was almost she was close to getting top 10 in the men overall. Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. pretty good. Cracking stuff for her, man. Mary Beth Ellis takes it out from Saleta Castro in second and Tineka van der Berg in third. And over on the men's side, it was won by Igor Amorelli from Mark Udbenik and Baz Dideden in third. Um, I don't think he's had a win before, has he, Igor Amorelli? I'm not sure. I, I think he, he, he may have won uh, Ironman Brazil before. I've, de- I've definitely uh, yeah. up there in uh, in that race. And a few others. He's he's if he I think he's won that, but he's definitely I been like, right, up yeah. a lot of races. Cool stuff. It's funny, isn't it, with there being so many Ironmans around the world over the last couple of years, it's really hard to keep track of what's going on. Just a few years ago there was only a pretty limited number of them and now it's like there's two or three or four every weekend, it seems like sometimes. Yeah, and and especially at this time of the year, you can get people who 
wouldn't necessarily be up there vying for the win that can target a couple of races and get wins because it's kind of a funny time of year. You've got some people that are scrounging around trying to get the last points to qualify for, for Kona uh, to get there. You've got the people that have qualified for Kona, so they're not racing an Ironman at the moment. And then you might have some people that think, think well, next year I can give it a good go. So they're kind of waiting until the points start counting for uh, 2017. So they they don't really want to do an Ironman man at the, like this time of year they'll wait three or four weeks you know until september so they can start accumulating their points for the following year all right gotcha so good, time, good time to make some money if you want to do some races go and hoover up some points hey yeah hey now then over in california we had vine man which is it is it used to be iron man california but it's it's full vine man now isn't it and it was taken out by kyle buckingham who used to live in great britain didn't he yeah i think he used to live in london he used to live in London and he was, if I remember rightly, I think two years ago, he was the overall age group champion in Kona. So he's made that step from racing age group at a very high level and stepped up to racing pro. And he's taken the, taken the win at Vyman, which is awesome. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good result for him. And I, I think he might have qualified for Kona again this year now, which he'll be really pleased with. because I think he was, that was his aim. Oh, good stuff. So Cal Buckingham takes it out in 8.27 from Chris McDonald in 8.34 and Jonathan Sheeran in 8.39. Over on the women's side, we've had another domination here from Sarah Piampiano. Nine hours, 19, placing her again just outside the men's top 10 by a minute or so from Ashley Paulson in 10.03. So she's won by 45 minutes, Joe. Yeah, that is pretty incredible to win by it that is, much. It is, isn't it? She must have basically lapped second place on the run yeah she must have done wasn't she yeah she must have been 10k ahead that must be disheartening <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know if she was just over 10k ahead the girl in, in second might have thought like god I've got a good chance of winning here they're only uh, a, a minute or two in front and then she get obviously gets a time split but like we'll ask their mate for the time split and her mate's like no she's a lap just over a lap ahead i mean you, your heart would just sink wouldn't it if you heard that it must be a really small pro field as well, because I can only count three or four pro women having finished in this race. Yeah, so no, no, I've heard about that. There was actually there was eight female pros. Um, it's just that some of them got beaten by age groupers. So a few age groupers oh, right. they raced as pros, they would have actually got some decent cash. So yes, yeah, so let's give a shout out to Caroline Lee. She was in the female thirty age group, and she's gone ten fourteen, and that's not a fast course either. So that is a really brilliant result there isn't it 30 year old so well done caroline yeah if she'd have uh, had her pro license she would have come away with um three thousand two hundred and fifty dollars it says on there so does, that yeah. would have been a big swing wouldn't it instead of paying to enter she would have uh from she could have got her accommodation free and gone away come away with three thousand dollars <laughs> that nice few quid in the pocket as well yeah <laughs> Right, listen, I'm going to put an interview up now that I did um, a couple of weeks ago. Just before Ironman UK, I went and um, visited the boys from Precision Hydration and had one of their sweat tests done. So, recorded it live on air, we'll play it through, and, uh, and then we'll have a little chat about it afterwards, Joe. All right, so I'm here at the Expo of Ironman UK. Um, I've come for a wander down to meet the boys from Precision Hydration because they've offered to do a sweat test on me to see if the sweat that's coming out of my skin is in fact as salty as we suspect that it might be. So a few of you will remember back in mid-May we did an episode where we interviewed Andy Blow from Precision Hydration. I've got Andy sitting here with me now. So uh, so how are you doing today, Andy? Yeah, good thanks, Rob. It's the, it's the usual thing here where I'm convinced actually that working at an expo before the Ironman is nearly as hard as the, and as tiring as the event itself, but it's all good for <laughs> and so I'm sitting down here. The guys have got a, a variety of little bits and bobs of computerized equipment, and uh, I'm going to get some um, some electrodes put on my skin, which is going to be part of the sweat test. So Andy, do you want to tell the listeners a little bit about how this is going to work and what it's going to do, please? Yeah, I mean, really quickly, one of the things that's difficult about analysing sweat is actually collecting a a clean sample of it so we use some technology that was developed for a medical application to stimulate the sweat glands in your arm and then we have a, a very uh, a patented little piece of technology that collects the sweat and allows us to put it straight through an analyzer so where you would think that you would have to exercise to sweat we can just do it sat in a chair here and the whole thing should take us less than 20 minutes 
All right, awesome. So I'm sitting here now. Andy's got some electrodes ready, hooked up to a, a little kind of computerized box. And apparently, I'm not going to feel a thing. I've been promised. <laughs> no permanent scarring, for sure. There's already plenty of permanent scarring inside my brain, mate, I tell you. So, uh, right, we're going to get some electrodes hooked up and see how we go. So Andy's just wiping the inside of my forearm with what's essentially just like a wet medical swab. And uh, then we've got two electrodes that are about, I don't know, about two centimeters across. Yeah. And they're going on my forearm. Then there's a kind of Velcro strip getting wrapped around one and hooking it on there. This looks like one of these studies from a from a 1970s Eastern European Sports Science Institute, yeah. mate. And you might you might feel a bit of light tingling on the skin underneath them when they're on. And what they're doing, that's putting a, a chemical in, into the sweat glands that causes them to start to produce sweat. And we run this for five minutes, then the sweat glands are stimulated and they'll keep producing sweat for another 30 minutes. And that's that's the time during which we collect it. And, and essentially, depending on your sweat rate, it it will um, that will dictate how long it takes us to get a sample and we need we only need a very small sample because some people can get one in five minutes other people will take 15 or 20 minutes okay so uh, so yeah it's quite a weird sensation actually there's uh, it's like you said it's very tingly it feels quite cold and quite tingly but it isn't painful at all which is which is cool because I've got memories from the old sports science laboratory at university where these things they go oh don't worry this won't hurt man and then you sit there going ah <laughs> yeah, no, luckily there's no um, no muscle biopsies or bloodletting or anything that needs to go on for this one. It's <laughs> relatively pain-free. All right, so we're going to sit here for five minutes for this on and we'll, we'll see what happens. So the machine's just gone beep. I've been on there for about five minutes now and uh, just really sat here and had a chat. There's nothing, nothing much going on. You couldn't really feel anything happening. And he's taking the electrodes off. And hopefully you can start to see there's a little bit you see that bit of sweat oh, yeah. starting to be produced under the red electrode so really bizarrely in the two centimeter circle where that electrode was i'm sweating in an entirely localized area yeah the chemical works in the same way that acetylcholine does when it's released from your brain and tells your sweat glands to sweat but it only instead of going out to everywhere it has just gone into that local spot on your arm so we we're now putting this collector down. It's got a pinhole in the bottom of it with some tubing above it. And basically, sweat will start to pool underneath the collector and then capillary action will draw it up into the tubing. Right, so now I've got like a, as Andy's described it, it looks almost like a wristwatch that's attached over my forearm with a couple of Velcro straps. And I guess there's loads of tiny little tubes in there. Uh, just one single tiny, very thin capillary tube. Okay, and the sweat's going to get sucked up into that, so... And how long does this usually take for the sweat to come up and uh, fill that area then? If you're a big sweater, then it can be... We can have enough within five or six minutes. Uh, it can take 15 or 20 minutes in some people. I would say the average is 10 or 12 minutes. Okay. So now we just sit back and watch, watch the yeah, excitement we, happen. Yeah, and the sweat... <laughs> Interestingly, the sweat will come through looking blue because there's a little bit of food dye in there which helps us to see it. Um, it freaks uh, people out sometimes, yeah. they wonder what's going on, but it's just <laughs> because sweat in a clear tube is quite hard to see. Got you. All right, so we'll have an update when my sweat turns blue. All right, so we've got, uh, well, it's quite weird actually. I've got about two or three curls worth of blue sweat has come up. It's all dyed blue, so Andy's going to remove this. Uh, what do you call that stuff that's in there, Andy? Well, this is this is a this is, this device is called a macroduct, and this is a special kind of plastic tubing that's sodium free, so it doesn't contaminate the sweat sample. Ah, right. So it's like plastic tubing that's yeah. wound round and round and round. Yeah, and what we do is we grab it like that and just peel it away, and then your sweat sample is in this little bit here. Ah, got you. So and then really clever. With a massive needle like this. <laughs> like, don't stand. Don't so for the listeners, arm. there's a there's a syringe here. It's, it's backstage at the Tour de France. This isn't it, Andy? Shouldn't say yeah, that. That's a terrible <laughs> thing to say. <laughs> um, so we've got a syringe stuck into the end of this. Uh, God knows what people walking by must yeah. be thinking of this at the moment. Then we cut that off, and then this. So you can take that off your arm now. Got you. And then we plug this this sample into the machine. 
and this is measuring the conductivity of the sample because the sweat the the electrolytes affect the conductivity as we run it through you'll see the numbers on here change and that's what I'm looking at and we take those numbers so just boost it through so Andy squeezed out the end of the syringe and that's pushed my sweat sample out of the tube and into the machine which is coming up with a reading of essentially how salty my sweat yeah, is right and, and really kind of unsurprisingly in your case because we know your case history of you're someone who's suffered with lots of cramping problems you've had lots of problems being having to go on a drip after the races your sweat on a this scale millimoles your your um, sweat sodium chloride levels showing up at, in the in the mid 70s so around 74 millimole to give you an idea of the range if we see someone with very dilute sweat, they would be losing 10 millimole per litre. I'm losing about 85 to 90 millimole, so I'm, and, and the highest we ever see is about 100, but 75 is right in that high, you know, the highest quartile. So, so that, that kind of sort of gives us evidence for what we thought from the, the sort of questions you gave me earlier on. Yeah. So and from our experiences, I'm a very salty sweater, even if I don't sweat huge volumes of the stuff out. Yes, exactly. And, and that's why you've benefited, when you've learned the hard way, as it were, you've benefited from taking lots and lots of salt in during races. Whereas for some people, the amount of salt that you take in would probably make them quite nauseous and sick you're you're absorbing it and, you, and and your body's using it because of the rate at which you're you're churning through it and losing it yeah. so i'm gonna i'm gonna yeah do you so i'll show you on this little graphic it won't we'll have to obviously describe it for the, for the listeners so andy's got his ipad mini out here and he's got a scale on the screen which he's typed my result into going from very low through to very high and the little mark that says you is stuck firmly in the very high category yeah. isn't it so you're losing almost exactly 1500 milligrams of sodium per liter of sweat which is you know which is why we've we've sort of guessed it and had you on the 1500 milligram product and yeah. Yeah, it's not always we're not all we don't always have as good foresight as that but it's quite lucky in, in this case that that is a like for like replacement for what you're losing in your sweat and to put that in context, i'm really impressed you said it'd be 1500 and it's 1515 milligrams yeah, so it's so, not bad man yeah we're close <laughs> we're close but to put it in context that's three times stronger than a normal electrolyte drink yeah so you know that's you would have to triple dose on a normal yeah. off the shelf product. so even if i was drinking a normal electrolyte drink it'd yeah. still be essentially watering down my electrolytes as i was exercising yes. and sweating exactly yeah yeah all right wow thanks very much man that's that's been really interesting i guess i know from now on i have to take a lot of sweat and a lot of salt as i exercise yeah as we suspected yeah, definitely. And this report, you know, this is it's got quite a lot of comprehensive information in it about how much to drink, when to drink it, that type of thing. So, you know, this goes through to you on your email when you've had a sweat test, you can read it. And then with an athlete, when it's a clear cut and dried case like this, it's quite easy to, you, to work the prescription off the back of it. Sometimes we get more ambiguous results with people. We get people whose maybe their their symptoms and their case history don't match the result quite so closely and then it starts a bit of dialogue and a bit of detective work to try and figure out what the best strategy is for them. But yeah. Alright great, thanks very much man. No worries. All right, it was a, a bit noisy in there, so we've just moved somewhere quieter. Um, I've got the sweat test all done and completed now. And I just wanted to ask Andy to tell us a little bit more about the new product that you've got coming out. Yeah, thanks, Rob. We've, we've been working on this one for a while. Um, we, we've we obviously currently got our effervescent tablets with different strengths of electrolytes in, and they've been really popular for the last few years. But we were, we were working with a couple of our professional sports teams in America um, actually a baseball team and a, an American football team and they wanted a they wanted a product with a couple of different features in it um, they wanted something which was 100% natural in composition and they wanted something with a little bit of carbohydrate in it um, because talking with their physiologist nutritionist we you know that that facilitates absorption of the fluids in the stomach so we've been working on those for quite a while we've been testing them with these pro athletes really happy with them now and we're just about to launch them um, out, out to everyone on our website all right great stuff so what is the what's the main difference then between between the new product that you've got coming out and the other stuff that's out on the market at the moment well a lot a lot of sports drinks at the moment sort of fall into one category or the other of being 
you know, zero calorie like an effervescent tablet or they're an, an energy trike drink with 6% carbohydrate. The one that we're bringing out is, is right down the middle. It has 3% carbohydrate in it. And what that, that does, that does deliver a little bit of energy when you're when you're exercising but that's not the primary aim of that carbohydrate what it's doing is is when you put a little bit of sugar and a little bit of salt into a fluid it enables the fluid to be absorbed faster in the gut because it opens up another pathway of absorption called um, sodium glucose co-transport and so we've we've sort of tried to incorporate that into it and at the same time um, we've we've been able now to make the product 100% natural, which you know is, is definitely something that we're quite keen on doing, <clears throat> and it's definitely something that a lot of people have spoken to us about and said that they 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 would prefer you know simpler, lower numbers of ingredients and a, and a simpler, more natural product. Yeah, and I've been testing out the new stuff as well, and I've got to say that the two things that are interesting about the fact that it's natural, you don't get that sort of really sweet, sickly, I guess it always comes, it's not always aspartame, but that kind of that kind of diet cokey super sweetness you haven't got any of that with it but obviously with me being a super salty sweater and I've been on the 1500 milligram one, it doesn't taste it, well, it doesn't taste that salty. It hardly tastes salty at all compared to in the past when I've been trying to tip salt tablets into my drink to get enough sodium in there. Is that because it's not sodium chloride, it's sodium citrate, and that just affects the taste differently? Yeah, absolutely. We use sodium citrate for a couple of reasons. I mean, it is a bit more expensive than just using normal table salt, sodium chloride. But, yeah, it definitely tastes a lot less salty. Um, you don't get that that seawatery edge that you would definitely get with with 1500 <laughs> yeah. milligrams of sodium in a in a in a serving um and it's also it's it's quite it's more alkaline so when you're drinking large volumes of it as you often are in long endurance events or on hot days it should leave your stomach a lot more settled you know a lot less acidic um sometimes people find that yeah, if you imagine if you can just imagine drinking a a cup of salty water it is very likely to make you feel sick and that that sodium chloride solution in in a liquid tends to do that to your stomach whereas using sodium citrate it's it's a lot less salty tasting it's a lot milder and, and more alkaline so sort of you know in, in all the testing we've done we've had much better response from people in terms of how their stomach feels yeah and that was my experience for sure in the past when when it was hot and i knew and i could feel i had to take salty drinks and any kind of electrolyte on the drink at the, on the market at the time was just leaving me feeling really sick because it was so salty yeah that's the trade-off um, that people like me and you have always had to make is you need you yeah. need to get the salts in so you're smashing back these saltier drinks or taking loads of salt tablets and yeah it can leave you feeling a bit nauseous if you're not careful Oh, good stuff. Well, hats off to you, man, for hopefully solving the problem for loads of people out there. Um, the new product is going to be out, we think, the week of the 8th of August. Is that right? That is, that is the plan. Monday the 8th of August. So it should, should be on the website for then. So fingers crossed then. The website address again for everybody is? Precisionhydration.com great stuff and uh and that's great thanks for coming on the show man thanks for doing the sweat test and it's been a it's been pretty groundbreaking for me as i've said to people because i've always felt like my days of racing are over because i just can't can't deal with being so ill at the finish line so my eyes are looking to the future now as well and i think this product will really help out people like me out there yeah no we're we're delighted rob delighted with the results for you and a lot of other people so thanks again for having us on so that was pretty much my sweat test experience there, mate. It's uh, pretty cool, actually, to be able to sit down in a chair and have some electrodes put on your arm and they turn it on, you start to sweat, they collect the sweat and then they analyse it and can tell you how salty your sweat is, mate. It's uh, pretty, pretty impressive technology. So, so what was your uh, result then from the test? I was one of the sweatiest guys they'd ever seen. Really? One of the saltiest, yeah. So most people come in in the, the 500 milligrams to a thousand area and i was at 1500 milligrams so three quarters of the way up their scale so not quite as sweaty as andy the guy who uh, who did the test but uh, it explained a lot about some of the problems i've been having when i've been trying to race long what, or race in the heat what problems have you had then when you've raced in the heat 
Right. So basically, for me, Joe, um, if you heard of hyponatremia, yeah, where you end up with, you know, you end up. Well, that can happen two ways. It can be if you drink far too much water, you end up with loads of water in your system. But with someone like me, I sweat out loads of salt, loads of sodium with each bit of sweat that goes out. So effectively, it's diluting the electrolytes in my body. So the worst one I ever had. I always get to the finish line feeling sick. Sometimes throw up. Often need a drip or two drips before. Before I can even stand up, my mind goes completely, and my fingertips, my hands go numb and tingly. And at, like at the worst one ever, when I did the World Championships in the Long Course World Champs in 08 over in Almira, I just passed out cold on the floor. Had to be carried to the med tent, and was just throwing up for an hour afterwards. Just throwing up and throwing up and throwing up and needed, I think, three bags of IV that day before I could even like get on the bus to go home. So obviously with the long distance racing, my missus has been saying to me, you know, you can't do this anymore. You're just making yourself really sick every time you do it. So yeah, it's weird, man. Even with taking loads of extra salt, I wasn't taking in nearly enough sodium. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So did you feel well, when you were, we're doing the racing or after racing. Do you feel? Did you feel bloated or did you feel um, dehydrated or like how? How did you like like your body? Well, I mean that's the weird thing. I didn't feel dehydrated at all, and I always made sure I was drinking loads. And towards the end of my racing, when I was realised something was up, I was even taking loads of sodium on. But with talking with Andy, I was taking two salt tablets an hour which was pretty much double what was recommended but that only had 500 milligrams in and i was losing 1500 milligrams so three times that in every liter of sweat that was going out so on a hot day god knows how much sweat i've been losing um but then having talked to andy when i did triathlon x a few weeks ago i took loads of their stuff while i was out on the bikes i was thinking if i pass out in the mountains man could be really dangerous you know you're not going to carry back by a spectator are you yeah yeah um so yeah i think for anyone who's racing in the heat or anyone who's had problems like this at the finish line i think to spend 100 quid having a sweat test done is like pretty pretty fundamental it's such a small amount of money compared to what you actually spend on the rest of your kit isn't it yeah no I definitely uh, like you put me in touch with and i'm hoping to uh to do one of them because i've found when i've raced in hot conditions that i haven't done nowhere near as good on the run as what i know i can do and i've almost like when i was in kona last year i felt i literally looked like i was pregnant um but then when they weighed me i was four kilos lighter um and i was drinking absolutely loads but i just it something doesn't feel like it's right and i don't know if that's because i'm not get like if i lose a lot of electrolytes or if i if maybe i don't i don't know but it's just just get an idea that there is something what i can improve on there yeah i think so and it's the thing i found is it's just peace of mind you know that someone said to you this is the number this is how much you're losing this is how much you need to take in and for me it was like great that box is ticked now and it sounds like man if you're finishing races looking pregnant and feeling bloated but also having lost loads of weight as well something's not quite right there is it yeah it's only happened in really hot races like i spoke to the guys at talk and i don't know maybe it might be different now because they told me that I was, it could be due to having too much fat prior to the race, like the night before and morning, because I used to have quite a lot. Um, so I cut that down. I haven't had it. Um, mm. But I haven't done a hot race since I've done that. So I don't know if that's something, um, if that might have helped as well or not. But yeah, like you say, peace of mind as well. So getting the test and then seeing, like it would be just good to, to get a number and know that I'm doing everything in that area right. Yeah, I remember Chris McCormack talking about him. He had about, five or six really bad races in Kona after basically destroying everybody at every other race in the world. And he ended up going in and having sweat testing done. And that's what they found with him, that he was his sweat rate was incredibly high and there was loads of sodium as well. So um, so that was the final piece of the puzzle for him, getting it sorted so that he could race well. So I hope they help you, man. I hope they manage to, you know, you get some answers from that. And at least you go... I left there feeling really confident knowing what was going on and knowing that I had a strategy and, you know, raced really well because of that, I feel like. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. Good. Good. Well, I'm glad we could hook you up, man, and we'll get that test done before you go out to Kona, hey? Yeah. Yeah, definitely.
Cool. Well, that's pretty much the end of the results from this week's show. Um, we're going to go over now to our interview of the week. I managed to uh, line up an interview with Brian Fogarty, who you'll know of, Joe. He's a British age grouper and he's pretty damn quick as well. He managed to finish fourth overall at Ironman UK recently. Yeah, I've met uh, Brian at a few, quite a few races. Um, he was also in Kona last year. I'm not sure if he's going this year. I know he's qualified, but I don't know if he's taken his... Uh, his place or not but yeah his cycling is uh is really strong and it seems like he's improved his swim a bit as well because that was always his achilles heel um one of the few people rob that makes me look good in the water <laughs> <laughs> outrageous <laughs> <laughs> he was he was uh he was seventh overall he wasn't fourth overall i got that one wrong um seventh overall but still man win the age group 59 minute swim 454 on the bike so he's matched all the top pros i think he's coached by uh my pal matt bottrell on the bike and then put together a 311 run so yeah we'll hand you over now to our interview with brian fogarty uh thanks very much for coming on the show and helping co-host joe and uh, on behalf of everybody all the best for your race out in kona buddy cheers thanks very much mate Brian Fogarty, welcome to the Cup of Tri Triathlon podcast, mate. How on earth are you doing tonight? I'm good, thank you, Rob. Yeah, really good, thank you. Oh, mate, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's uh, it's a real honour to have you on after having stood at the roadside at Ironman <laughs> UK a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I was desperately, I mean, you'd have seen this at the time. The listeners won't know it because it didn't work out as well. But I had the little MP3 recorder in my hand. Did you? And I was, I was trying to grab interviews with people as they went by, just like a couple of words and stuff. And all I got out of Roman Guillaume was like, oh, I'm going to be sick again. <laughs> <laughs> and then after like three or four people had ignored me, you came bounding by and you were like, Oxygen Addict, I listened to your podcast, mate. <laughs> And I thought that's brilliant. Oh, I've been dying to get on. I've been. I mean, I was. I was having a laugh not long ago with uh, you, you know Tony Cullen, and uh, yeah, we were yeah. both talking. We're saying oh, who's going to be first to be asked to go on because we've been obviously listening to it for quite a while now. And you've had some really good people on. I thought, come on, a few more good results, I might get a chance. And uh, I've seen you. I thought, you've done it, like... mate. You've done it. You've beaten him out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So listen, let's start with the Ironman UK result, and then we'll go backwards and, and hear your story. But um, obviously, you had a you had a fantastic day out there, and you ended up seventh overall, and you were second age grouper, weren't you? Yeah, yeah, I was. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the performance on the day was was um, it was one of those days where everything went right. I mean, as well as an Ironman can do, especially. Um, and I was, I, I've had a bit of bad luck last year with with a puncher. Um, and I, I live on the course on the I live like minutes from the bike course. I've been on the course a lot, and I, I knew the performance was there. I, ju- I just, as you know, it's just knowing it's there and actually putting it into practice and actually executing it's another thing. And uh, it was, yeah, it was amazing to actually actually have, have the results. At, there's certainly the top ten I've been after. I've been after that first. I was I was hoping for the first amateur, but but obviously um, that uh, the, the lad the, uh, the the bike the unbelievable bike was was there who. Uh, yeah, the Irish lad. I've forgotten his name off the top of my head. He was a bandit, um, really. I think he was an ex, he's an ex-pro. He was, he was a pro last year. So I, well, that's it, isn't it? So we don't count him. We don't <laughs> no, count that him. No, was it. In my head, <laughs> my head's a pro, so... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's right, man. If he's race pro, then then for the purpose of this interview, sorry, but we're not counting you. Sorry, Brian. <laughs> so... Uh, Let's let's talk through the race from the start. Obviously, they had a bit of a switch this year to the rolling swim start, which I often think puts a guy like you in a. Well, I assumed it put you in a in a difficult position because, you know, the pros off they go, and then you've got to kind of weave your way through and stuff. But how did it work out? Was it advantageous or was it like a bit of a pain? Um, having that rolling well, it's actually the second year, Rob. They actually did they had they did have it last year. They introduced it last year as well. Oh, I'm getting old, mate. Um, <laughs> there you go. No, they had a rolling start last year too. Yeah, um, but yeah, it's one of those, isn't it? You can understand why they do it. Um, it's it, it does help people um, in terms of the fear factor. Um, obviously, we've been there from the start where it was two and a half. Well, Lanzarote this year is two and a half thousand people starting in one, and it's carnage, isn't it? But um, so it does help that side of it. And um, I, I don't know if it helped me really. I'm not so sure. I did have my best swim today by, by quite some way, but but again I felt that was coming. I just, just needed to again execute it. Um, I managed to, um, to to get in a nice little group quite early, and um, I just 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 kept it there. And it yeah, I was really pleased. It was good. Apart from the second lap, it, um, we started hitting hitting sort of the, you know the, the people from the first lap, which which did did um, 
did slow things a bit, but actually that's part and parcel. Um, so no, yeah, I do think it's a positive thing. I do. I think it's a good move all round, to be honest. Although it does, like you say, um, it does it does change things regarding the dynamic of, of the actual race. We, 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 you know, trying to trying to get in amongst the pros with, with being five minutes behind. It does change yeah. things, you know. Well, I guess that's the next question, really. You get this five-minute kind of buffer behind the pros as you go on. So really, it, it it's almost, I guess, like a separate race, isn't it? And you might be riding into the tail end of the pros mm. pretty early on. How did how did the bike sort of play out for you? Because obviously your bike time was it was right up there with the the lead pro men's time. So did you actually catch them up on the bike and end up riding with most of them, or were you sort of riding that five minutes behind them the whole way? Yeah, yeah, I was picking them off. Obviously, with my, you know, from in terms of the pros, I'm I'm also obviously a weaker swimmer, so I did get amongst them. I, I passed I passed a good few, um, you know, probably lesser known pros, um, and and a, and a, a real confidence boost for me was was um, about about maybe 15 miles from no maybe 20 miles. I, I went past um, Fraser Cartmel. Um, oh wow! So yeah, obviously I was well aware of who he was. Um, so yeah. at that point you know you're having a good day don't you <laughs> yeah because obviously I, I know he's a, a fantastic swimmer as well so um yeah I, I certainly went past him and, and I thought well I'm I'm, I'm on a good I mean quite a good place here um I just just got up, hope I hold it out for the run that was the key then but yeah the, the bike I certainly intended to get amongst them and, and I certainly was, was very confident I could go under five hours um from you know from the training I've been doing it was um it was something I was confident to doing yeah. And do you think it's a big advantage living near the course and getting to train on it so often? I do, Rob, yeah. I do. I think it's um I think when you know every every pothole on a course, certainly like Bolton with so many dead turns and, and undulating and yeah, I, I, I do. And and as long, while it's in Bolton I'll be doing it every year because I just think it is a huge advantage. Um Yeah. And what's the what's the support like for a local lad like you out on the Bolton course? Oh man, it, I'll be honest, it's absolutely amazing. It's fantastic, and it's getting bigger and bigger every year. <laughs> it was amazing in the town this year, wasn't oh. it? It was it was like being at a, a huge international marathon. Yeah, it was so vibrant, I, and I'm I'm so lucky. I did, I'm, obviously, my, my friends and family come, but it, it's people you know sprout up from all over. You think, bloody hell, I've, I've you know, I, I, how are you doing? And I try and acknowledge them all because <laughs> I'm so full yeah. of them coming and cheering me on. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. And, and a lot of the lads from, from the team with her. So again, obviously more people with her supporting, you know. But yeah, it was fantastic. And it's, it's growing every year so well. Um, I, I'm loving it. I really love the race. Yeah, I really feel as though it's grown into its venue. I think they've they've had the course sorted out for the last few years now. So the marathon feels like, a, you know, there's that out and, out and back stretch where you've got to get into the actual town from from the Reebok Stadium. But once you're there and you're onto the loop, the loop is really well supported the whole way, isn't it? So it's like you get 10k or so of running to the loop and then 32k with crazy crowds most of the way around. Yeah, yeah and, it, and it, it's it's challenging. It, it, is, it isn't no, it's not a fast course. It's a tough course. Um, it's one on its own. I think is that Bolton Marathon course. I really do. Yeah, there's not a. There's not more than a few feet of flat on it on any of the laps, are there? Oh, no, not at all. And then you got yourself off the bike. So I'm looking at the splits in front of me. You swam a 59 and then you biked a 4.54. And then to put that into perspective, Marcus Tomska, who's renowned as being one of the strongest pro cyclists, has ridden the 4.52 and a half. And a lot of the other pros are riding above five hours there. You've outsplit Harry Wiltshire, you've outsplit Fraser Cartmel by, and not just slightly, you've outsplit them by sort of 15 to 20 minutes. So it really does put a, a sort of a stamp of approval on how strong your biking has got. Yeah. Have you always been a really strong biker or is it something <laughs> that you've, you've sort of come to recently? Um, no, it's, a, it's funny really. But I mean, I, I've actually only been doing triathlon for, for five years. Okay. Um, um, without any biking background, um, my background all my life's been football um, to a, re- a relatively decent level. I went, I was full time. I've signed full time forms for Burnley um, football club when I left school and, and didn't make the grade for for various reasons. That fizzled out, and and I took up running. And I became a a decent ish club runner uh, for Blackburn Harriers, um, and and I just um, I never ridden a bike. I, I'd never ridden it, and. Um, I got it. I've got obviously developed. I decided I wanted to do Ironman. I got into 
got a bike. Um, a couple of lads down at the running club sort of inspired me a little bit, um, you know, into it, into the Ironman. Um, Paul Guy and Martin have told him during a long time, and I sort of looked up to him, so I thought I'll give it a shot. Uh, got a bike, um, and to be honest, I, th- I think I'm just just more naturally designed for for biking. Really, um, I've just gone from strength to strength, and it was it was my first my first coach. Well, not my second coach. I had Mark Mark Mark, um, Mark lives here, who's been on the show. He sort yeah. of got me training to a point of, of really starting to get into the biking and, and and sort of understanding it a bit more and how it works. And and I've just gone on from there. And they, I've never sort of I've done it as a as part of the three disciplines, so I've, I've built it up, but I've never really focused on it, Rob. But I've, I've developed into quite a good, good bike. Because it's only this year, I've sort of really thought, well, let's let's give it a shot in in terms of really focusing on it. Um, and, and I've I've uh, got coach uh, Matt, Matt Bottrell. Um, I'm sure I think he's been on the show as well. He, he I sort of you know got into yeah him. yeah. He's we had a good interview with Matt on a, a few months back, didn't we? So. Uh... So there you go. You've gone with the the Uber bikers biking coach now, hey? Absolutely. Well, he's the man. He's the man in the know, isn't he? If, you know, if he doesn't know it, it it's not worth is, knowing. Yeah. But it was actually his his second in command, Gareth Pym, who, who have who's been coaching me up, up to this point um, and got me in a really good place. And and again, I, I, I've just developed into a, a strong biker, and it's um, and, and there's from what Matt, you know, hopefully I can develop on a lot more as well. Yeah, well, one of the big secrets is, of course, that there isn't any secrets. You've just got to train hard and train consistent. And it certainly sounds like you've been doing that over the past few years, mate. So, I mean, full respect to you. I don't think many people realize when they see a guy like you putting up results as being, you know, first or second age grouper at at Ironman UK, depending on how we look at it, multiple time Kona qualifier. I don't think people realize that when you say you took up triathlon five years ago, you genuinely did take up triathlon five years ago (laughs) and you you pretty much started as a non-swimmer, didn't you? Absolutely. Yeah. I I couldn't swim a length. Yeah. I've started, this is where I can relate with so many people. You know, people think, you know, I, I sometimes I think there was thing I'm doing a long time. I, I've been there, just where I've been doing a length and I'm now hyperventilating, and it seems like yesterday. And I just, <laughs> yeah. You, you, you know yourself, Rob, without doing it as a as a kid, it's it is such a frustrating thing. Um, yeah. But I, but you know what, mate? If you if you've been like us and you've been a rubbish swimmer who's got half decent. I think that you never lose the thrill of getting in the water and being able to swim and not losing your breath. Yeah. It's always like a novelty, isn't it? it? Is. You go, this is great. I can keep going. Yeah. <laughs> I think the kids who swam when they were kids really miss out on that and haven't always been able to swim. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. And just to, to, when, you, when you actually finally feel like make a small breakthrough in the swimming, it, it's the best feeling because it, it's so hard for, for, for us. It's so difficult. Um, yeah, it's it's such a, a good feeling to actually break. Whether it's just breaking a PB, you know, for, for your four hundred, you, you're just making them them inroads to uh, to getting it down. The good thing is there is so much more to come because you know the top guys prove how how fast you can go. Um, well, that's it from from your point of view, I suppose. You're looking at this and you're thinking, I've got the same bike split here as the top guys in the sport. I've got the same, you know, physiologically, I must have the same fitness as them. Um, in terms of heart and lungs, it's just learning to apply force to the water, isn't it? Yeah. So it's pretty exciting to see how far you can go in swimming terms, mate. Yeah, that that, that that'll be, that's what gives me a lot of a lot of encouragement. Um, and I, I train with the right people, and I'm I'm, I'm listening to the right people. Um, starting working with with a, with a lady lately, uh, Tanya Slater. Um, oh my, yeah, my, no, my, yeah, Tanya's done a lot of work with Helen. Yeah. The, Helen, the co-host oh, yeah, of the yeah, show, she's yeah. a fantastic swim coach. Oh yeah, she's lovely. She she's got a good company, um, a good coaching business, and she she's really keen to help me out. Um, Karen Driver is another another lady that was helping me for quite a while, um, and I'm just just all the time just just trying to get tips and advice. I, I spoke to Joe Joe Skipper last year about it, and he he gave me a couple of good, a good, really good tips, um, and I, I took them away with me. It was really you know really helpful. Yeah top lad he'll be the co-host on this version of the show tonight actually oh, is he? <laughs> <laughs> so when you listen to this he'll have been just talking about you just before this mate <laughs> oh, good yeah. top guy really really good guy inspirational to, to anyone that's trying to uh trying to make the grade and, and, and you know get to a good level he's, he's ace yeah good stuff 
Um, I want to ask you about your so your first triathlon experiences then, because you've said, you know, you've come into this as a non-swimmer, you've bought a bike, you've always been a decent runner and you've been fit for me football. What was your first triathlon and what was your experience like when you did it? first triathlon was, was the legendary uh, epic events one, Horwich. Horwich the Horwich triathlon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd, a nice easy one to start with, oh eh, Brian? Oh God, yeah, I'd, I'd done some stupid <laughs> bike ride the day before. I think I, I, I travelled over with some guys. I went to watch the, the Three Peaks. I watched the mate racing over there. Uh, I'd gone, I'd, I'd, I'd ridden my longest bike ride the day before over to Three Peaks. Nearly about eighty-five miles. I come back and I was doing my first triathlon the day after. It was absolutely crazy, but I loved every minute of it, and I, I was hooked. Once, once I could call myself a triathlete and I could swim and I could bike and I could run. I was hooked, and I just thought, right, I'm gonna come back next year, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna absolutely blitz that time, and and I just did it. I just a lot of races in my first year, I did. I've done them every year since because it's such a great way of of just seeing your marking your improvements. I love it. Yeah, I love that stuff, man. And then, which was your first uh, your first Ironman that you did? When was my that? First Ironman was in 2011. That was uh, Switzerland. Okay, um, and what times did you do there, just for comparison? So was a, yeah, Switzerland eleven or nine. Um, Solid. Yeah, it was it was good. It was all right. I mean, I did it on a road bike. I was um, I was clueless really. I, I really was. I didn't have uh, much any help of any any sort really. Um, and yeah, get, just just it, my whole objective initially was, was like most people, just just seeing the challenge of Ironman and and just wanting to complete it. Um, but as you do, we Iron Man, you get bitten by it, don't you? And you just want more. That's pretty addictive. Mm. How many have you done now? Uh, I think I've done. I think last count, I've done 12, 12, 11 or twelve. Wow! I did Switzerland, Switzerland, Frankfurt, UK corner, um, Austria, Bolton corner, Lanzarote, Bolton corner, Lanzarote, Bolton. So I think it's eleven now. I mean, it'll be. Corner and off to Kona again. Corner be twelve, yeah. And let's talk about that first qualification then, because obviously it sounds like were you about three years into your Ironman journey when you first qualified? Two years. It was my, yeah. Two, two years. Two years. Wow. Two years, and it was Bolton. Bolton was the one. Okay, and um, and how fast did you have to go at Bolton to qualify that year? I think it it was about nine forty two. Okay. Nine forty two, if, if I remember correctly, around that time. It was when there was three loops. Um, oh yeah, 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 I remember that. I think I did it that year. Yeah, it was. That was a tough old course, eh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm not so sure. I was to and fro with was it, which is the quickest bike route. I'm not. I'm still not sure which is the quicker. Was it when they had the swim in the reservoir that year? No, no. It was at Pennington. It was still at. It was at Pennington. Oh, okay. Uh, All right. It might have been 2013, Rob. Actually, it might have been. I'm trying to remember when I did it and the swim was. Yeah, yeah, 13. 2009. 13, 14, 15. Yeah, this is my fourth, so yeah. 13 it was, yeah. Oh, I'm getting old, mate. I'm forgetting <laughs> how many times I've had it there now. <laughs> the year I did it, the swim was in um, the, the is it Angles Arc Reservoir. Is that yeah. what it's called? Few of my mates from Fumi Pals did it that year. Yeah, I believe it was, um, yeah, it was quite a tough, wasn't it? <laughs> It was a tough old swim, that one. They'd left the, left the turbines on at one end and we were swimming for about an hour and a half. It's like being in a treadmill. Oh, dear. So you managed to qualify there at Bolton and then you went over to Kona. And how was your first Kona experience? To be honest, to date, my, Kona, my first Kona experience was, was the, my fastest. Um, I, was it really? Yeah, wow. Yeah. We, we, I think, I think in, in Kona terms, it was as good a day as you can get um, weather-wise that year. Um, so I was lucky with that, and um, I suppose I went in with it, wanting to. So I, I didn't take any risks. I sort of just kept it solid, um, ticked all the boxes, and come away with. with, with I think it was about nine thirty, nine thirty one. Um, and yeah, yeah, it was an amazing experience. Yeah, it was. Um, it was a bit of a last minute thing. I certainly didn't expect it to qualify. So my two brothers and, and my best mate came. Um, and we had a whale of a time. But it was a bit short and sweet, you know. It was it was a bit of a budget on a budget, and again, it's hard to do Kona on a budget, isn't well, it? As yeah, well, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, but again, it was one of those. I just thought, oh, I've got to come back. I've got to come back, and I've got to do that race again, um, and, and 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 improve it. And I haven't actually done yet. I I, I had a decent race. I, I sort of the year after I had I had a better performance, um, but didn't have the time because I got a tough day. But then last year was 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 was, was pretty was my toughest Ironman to date. It was uh, I really suffered on the run, 
and then have to dig deep to even finish. Um, yeah. So this year is even more important for me to to make sure I I put that right, put that wrong right, really. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's it's funny, isn't it, how you can have one of your best days and not go as fast, and then you can have your toughest day and you can do really well time wise. It's yeah. so much dependent on the variables out there. Yeah, it is. Um, but 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 even last year, it's amazing how you know it was it was such a hard day. I mean, I was like, I've never walked in a marathon. I'd gone, I'd gone after eight miles, and I just. It was just hell, but I actually got. So, I felt in the end when I when I sort of went through the dark moments, I, I did actually have come out this year a, a stronger triathlete from it. Yeah, you know when you, you sit back and analyze it and, and make a few adjustments and sort of think what did go wrong and and hopefully, like I say, hopefully I can 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 put it right this year with, with a really good performance. Excellent stuff. Well, listen, I've got to ask you this. This question's banging around in my head, so I'm sure some of the listeners that we have been the way that they are will be will be shouting at me to ask you this. How how is it that you've gone from your first Ironman in 11:06 to qualifying for Kona and going 9:30 in the sh- in the space of a couple of short years? What are the training secrets that you've got, Brian, that you're not sharing with <laughs> us at the moment? Come on, brother, give them up. To be honest, right, there's a few things. I mean. I'd have to say, firstly, is getting training with the right people, getting the right advice, um, and just the old thing of the consistency and just taking the, just dedicating. I've, I've, I absolutely, seriously, just dedicated mass more my life to it. Um, obviously, I've, I enjoy it along the way, but I, I'm just constantly searching and asking people for advice and just picking it up and, and just that consistency and. And that's it. And just taking every margin you can. And, and again, this year I've just took things a little bit more serious in terms of my diet. I'm just trying to take every little ounce I can. Um, and that and that is it. It, it really is. Um, There's no secrets. You've just got to keep training, huh? Absolutely. Yeah. Just just consistency. And it's got to be. I do think to a large extent it's got to be a 24/7 thing. You, you've got to live it and love it. And and I, and I do. I, one thing I, I love about this. This thing, and again, like I know, I refer to him a lot, but but Joe's setting the setting the stu- you know, setting the standards uh, in this country, and he just says it how it is, and, and it, it is. It's just just train hard and keep keep you know, just keep going for it, keep trying, keep keep aspiring to improve. Well, well, let's go through your training a little bit then, man. Let's start with let's start with the swim training that got you from from being a non-swimmer. What habits did you put in place? How many times a week were you swimming? How long was each session? Were they on your own? Were they with clubs? How did that work to get you from, you know, a non-swimmer firstly through to someone who could confidently complete the first triathlon? Well, I joined a local swim fit um, group, which is similar to like a Masters, uh, Darwin Swim Fit. Um, in, well, in fact, initially yeah. I, I was a member at uh, Preston, um, Virgin, Virgin Active in Preston, where there's a group of, of lads from Preston there. It was a similar sort of thing. The group of triathletes, you probably know a few of them, um, and and they turn up every Wednesday, Friday, and and, and just just crack on and get and get some good sets done. Uh, I sort of started off there, and then I've sort of started training close to home now at, at Darwin, um, Darwin Leisure Centre with, with a guy there that uh, Matt Donnelly. He's like a, he's been working for the council a long time, and he, he's he's amazing. He really goes out his way to to, to give me help and advice where he can. And and I just a lot of it is just literally turning up for the sessions with him, and they're always sixty minutes, um, and he's just always giving me pointers, and, and I, I've taught just done that because I, I if you had asked me to go and just go and, and do a set by myself with all the will in the world, I do I do struggle with it, um, but when you're amongst other people, um, you know I just think it helps you bring you brings you along massively, and I just, yeah, yeah I've, I've been through so many frustrating times with the swimming, and obviously. I'm far from being fully accomplished, but but this year breaking that hour was such a massive thing for me. Um, hey, I tell you what, and you've done well, because It wasn't a fast swim this year either. There was lots of people were were a lot slower than they thought they were going to be in this swim. So that's a good swim to break the hour as well this year, mate. I think. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, that that was. I mean, I'd, I suppose I knew, I knew I was. I knew it was going to be a good day just from that coming out in fifty nine. Um, yeah, it was it was good, and and I, I come away actually thinking it was comfortable so i do believe that there's you know there's a lot more to come um it's just maybe a, you'll be snapping at skipper's heel soon hey <laughs> no, he's, he's differently he can hit, but but no he's the one that we, you know he's setting the standard and, and that's that's where we, we you know I'm, we're all trying to improve and, and get better and, and who knows where, where we can go with it 
That's right, man. So you swim in? Are you swim in most days these days? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, I do, I do. I swim, I swim at least four times a week. Um, and that, but that I get something, just a bit of advice that, that Joe gave me last year in a time trial just before he set off to call, and I was just just in, in his ear a bit about a few bits of advice. And he and he said this to me, and he probably relates to a lot of a lot of triathletes who are trying to improve the swimming. And he asked me how many times I swim, and and. My first thing was, was was most days, like every day. And he said, do you not think you swim too much? And I, I, I thought about it. And he, I said, well, what, what do you mean? Because I've, I've always thought, you know, as, as most people do, like more is better. Well, he said, well, are you fully focused in, in them sessions or are they, are a lot of them, are you just going through motions? And, and I said, well, well, yeah, I am, to be honest. He said, well, he did the same. He said he, he went through a period where he was swimming a lot and wasn't really getting the games. And he said he, he sort of just knocked a couple back but made two of the ones he did were quality. And he said he really noticed a big improvement. And, and I've sort of done that a little bit and just, just made sure I'm, I'm ready for the sessions to make them count. Um, and and that, that's something that, that struck a chord with me and, and I've sort of moved, you know, moved on with that. And, and I think that's a, you know, a good bit of advice. Oh, that's great. People up and down the country are celebrating the, the advice of swim less and get faster. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you know what I mean. Though. To a point, obviously, you, you've got you've got to you've got to swim plenty to, to improve. But uh... I've got to say, Brian, I've swum four times this year, and I'm not seeing myself get any faster. <laughs> so it's not working for me. This advice. <laughs> Oh, do as you say, not as I do. That's the line, mate. Right, and then on to the bike. Obviously, the bike is your weapon, isn't it? Let's talk about the kind of biking that you're doing. First up, how many days a week do you ride? I ride, uh, yeah, a good five times a week, um, sometimes six. Yeah. So you're pretty much out there every day. Yeah. And how long will each one of the sessions be? Does it vary between... Yeah. I, I guess it's hard to say, but what would a standard week on the bike look like for you? It's, it, well... The, the the block I've just started speaking with Matt about now going into corner it's, it's going to be a big one and, and by the looks of it, it it's it, it was such a point, it's not just how big it is the intensity it's you know we're knocking on 12 13 hours um of, of intense some intense stuff yeah it's just really pushing those limits and, and seeing where we can go with it because he, he's he's certainly giving me the vibes that you know me, me numbers are, are good and, and really starting to to show you know some good signs so but yeah, but that's the key. So it's intense. I'm, I'm finding it's intense, and, and that's the way to do it. No, there's no, no easy stuff. A very little stuff, easy stuff. Yeah, that's one thing I noticed when I started working with Matt. He he doesn't do any slacking on the bike. There's no five hour coffee rides in there either at all, no, mate. At all. No, he doesn't <laughs> want to know that. No, and it's right though. It's 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 that's how it is. I think it's making it count while you can. Yeah, definitely. And have you done any work, sort of aerodynamics and position and stuff like that with him? Because I know that that's one thing Matt excels at, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, obviously, I went to see him initially, and, and he sort of pointed out um, a couple of things. Um, I've just recently changed into a, a smaller frame, which is hopefully going to suit my position a bit better. Um, but yeah, I think I think it is. I think I think that I think certainly when you get to a level. Um, and then, as they talk a lot about it in, in cycling, that like marginal gains, and I think, yeah, obviously at Matt's level, you know, they were they were massive. Um, the little things become big things. Um, so yeah, I've certainly looked into that and to refine my position a bit better. Um, so yeah, there's something in that I think, and even the, nowadays it's about the skin suits and every bit of. I keep getting told I should shave my beard off. Actually, that, that's that's costing me a few watts apparently. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, I saw an article right where um, God, who was it? I think it was Jesse Thomas went in the wind tunnel, and something happened, and he ended up shaving his legs in some downtime. And when he went back in, shaving his legs had saved him ten watts. <sighs> So if shaving his legs has saved him 10 watts, I can't believe what shaving your beard off would save you, mate. You'd have another 30. It'd be like Brad Wiggins. I think, I, I, to be honest, I will be doing that for, for a while. I'm, uh, I can't keep this beard for that long. Tell him it's like a trip strip. <laughs> it's just breaking up the boundary layer around your hair or helmet. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. And what about the running then? Now, you mentioned earlier you're a Blackburn Harriers lad yeah. um, and you've always done a, a lot of running and the running around your way is tough. There's <laughs> there's a rich history of seriously good fell runners and cross-country runners come out of there because nowhere's flat, is it? And nowhere's dry mm. around where you live. <laughs> Not at all, no. Yeah, there's, there's a cracking group at Blackburn Harriers. Some really, um, your Ben Fishes, your Paul Guinans and Matt Nuttalls, they've set the stall for years here. 
Um, and I'm I'm lucky. I'm, I'm lucky to train with them because I think I think that's so important. Training with with better runners, biking with better bikers, swimming with better swimmers. I think it's a massive thing. Um, and I, I run for Blackman, and that that is something I, I do believe. Um, I do believe I haven't really fulfilled my my sort of Ironman run yet. Um, and it's something I'm really going to look to try and explore coming now for, for the block towards corner, because I, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced I can run that sub three hour. I just, I just, I think, I think it's hard to focus on my biking and focus on my running with with real intent at the same time. Um, so I'm just trying to find that balance where I can hopefully, you know, get the best of both worlds and really yeah. get that run, execute that run that I believe I can. Well, your biking's there now, mate, isn't it? No one can argue with the fact you put a bike split out that's that's equal to guys like Marcus Tomska. So, yeah. I mean, that that says everything. You can now change your focus a little bit and really focus on hacking ten minutes off that run or so. Yeah. Um, what would what would some of the key Ironman specific run sessions be that you think that you feel have helped you the most prepare for? For your Ironmans, then. Well, I, I still th- I still believe in in in, um, in getting good quality speed work in. Um, I, I do, and again, I, I, I yeah, I think that's important to keep your legs fit. I don't think it's all about long, slow running. Um, I, I think you, you you're probably better off doing sixteen miles off off a bike, um, you know, at a good a good lick than than doing a long, slow twenty five mile run. Um, but I mean, I don't know. I, I'm, Again, I'm 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 just all just figuring out myself, um, because I know there's you obviously get a lot out of a long steady run as well, um, so I don't know. It's the old uh, I've not really nailed it myself yet, Rob. So I'm, I'm trying it's to it's it baffling, out. is it still? <laughs> I'm trying to figure it out as we go along now. Um, but, Do you run a lot of hill reps with your boys up where you are? Uh, yeah, well, yeah. There's there's a, there's, a, there's always a, there's a killer Wednesday run we do, which turns into a, pretty much a race, <laughs> a race every every <laughs> every sun, every every Wednesday um, with some big climbs. But no, we don't really do specific hill reps. We just a lot on the track, um, and, and just yeah, just just we just a lot of quality running, yeah, intervals and, and that sort of thing, really. Yeah, gotcha. So it sounds like there's sounds like there's gains been made there yet still as well, mate. Hey. Hopefully, yeah. Well, yeah. I'm. I'm oh, yeah. I'm convinced there is, Rob. Um, yeah, it's just 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 getting it. <laughs> and what would the, what would be the big dream for you then, mate? You're obviously you're only 32 still. Um, do you have dreams of going to Conan and winning your age group? Do you have dreams of turning pro? Do you have dreams of winning Ironman UK? What's the what's the future hold for you? Um, well, if I can keep keep up, you know, I, I'm I'm very lucky this year. In the last twelve months, I've I've had help from well, as I, the best I'm getting, I'm getting support from better support from my company, my my insurance business. So I'm, I am getting that you know a bit of freedom to to train that bit more. Um, the local firm, um, Universal Cooling, who, who've got on board and, and really want to help me. Um, sort of reach my potential. Um, so I'm just sort of taking it every, you know, every, every bit of the time. And, and corner's obviously a big focus. So I, I, yeah, I, I do believe if I can put a good run into to corner, I can certainly, I can certainly have a good, I know, have, have a realistic shot of, of sort of getting on the podium. Um, you know, I've got to dream big, and and, and I think my my my, my result in Bol- in, Bol- in Bolton and Lanzarote this year have given me that confidence that that I can go and and sort of mix it a bit and. Yeah, what happens. But then from from moving on next year, yeah, one day I'll, I'll be honest, Rob, I, I never quite made the grade at football. So I would, I'd love to be, love to race as a professional. Um, one day I think anyone would. Um, but on the same sense, I, I wouldn't want to just race as a professional without actually being able to train as one. If that makes sense. Um, yeah. You know, you, you're sort of doing it with one arm behind your back, aren't you? Really, you, you're racing as a pro, but if you're not training, being able to train quite as one. You're not really giving yourself your best chance. Um, well, obviously, as a guy who's still working at the moment, what are some of the time management tips you've got then that people can learn from? Because you've obviously mornings. you've said, say again, early mornings. How early? Go on. Oh, How early yeah, do you get up? Five mate? I'm up at five every day. Are you really? Yeah, yeah. and then then after work, um, yeah, double sessions every day, pretty much. Just just like I said earlier, just just living it. Just I mean, my wife, obviously, you know. She, she doesn't know anything different now, so she, she supports me massively. And I think when you get good results as well, you, you sort of your, your friends and family that a little bit more supportive because they sort of see your journey, what you're on, um, and where you're trying to go with it. And, and you know your, your proper friends will support that, and that helps massively. Uh, you don't get the grief for like missing the 
missing the annual Blackpool trips and things like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, they understand why you can't come on them and the stag do's and whatever. You, you just can't do them. If, if you want to be serious about what you're doing, you, you've just got to take them sacrifices. And I'm, I'm doing them. I'm trying. I'll tell you what, mate. It sounds like you're, you're living as professional a life as you possibly can around the constraints of, of someone who works full-time already. So so good on you, man. It's great to see the success that you've had. Thanks, and um and I'd love to see you get that age group podium out in Kona, mate. It would be it'd be a fantastic reward for all your hard work over the years, I think. Thank you very much, yeah. And who knows, maybe next year we'll see you racing pro and uh, in that top ten earning some pennies, hey? <laughs> hopefully, mate, yeah, hopefully. One day we'll see. The hometown that that's that's the big dream, isn't it? We've always supported Joe Skipper, but if there's a hometown victory to be had, <laughs> sorry Joe, but we're cheering for Brian. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's great. It's great. Well, while the race is at Bolton, I'll I'll certainly be I'll be on the start list every time. Awesome stuff. Well, listen, mate. Thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate. It. I know it's getting late, and you're gonna have to get up and train at five in the morning. So, thanks for all the tips you've given. I'm sure I've learned a lot, and I'm sure the listeners have as well. And uh, fingers crossed, mate. We'll be cheering for you at Kona, and we'll see how you get on there. Thanks, Rob. It's uh, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Oh, you're welcome, and we'll have you back on the show later on, and you can tell us all about your next successes, mate. Top man, thanks a lot, Rob. Cheers, buddy. Bye bye.